Welcome to the Overdrive Outdoors podcast. Your source for everything outdoors. Let's kick it into overdrive. Overdrive Outdoors podcast brought to you by Predator Hunter Outdoors. Whether you are new to predator hunting or looking to upgrade your equipment, Predator Hunter Outdoors will have you hunting after the sun goes down. Carrying a full line of lights, night vision, and thermal optics, along with tripods, calls, mounting systems, and more, check them out at www.predatorhunteroutdoors.com or on Facebook at Predator Hunter Outdoors. Use promo code OVERDRIVE2021 for 20% off your order. All right, everybody. Tonight we're here with Kevin Raw and Mike Luttrell. Is that right? That's I got good. it right the first time in two first years. Time. First time. <laughs> we we last time we were uh, recording a podcast. Mike and myself and my brother Joe were in the Upper Peninsula hunting. Uh, we kind of introduced ourselves, but tonight we want to bring in Kevin Rock. Kevin is the co-founder of Overdrive Outdoors with me. How are you guys doing tonight? I'm doing all right. Doing good. Have either of you been out hunting in the last week, week and a half? I have not. uh, Just too much stuff going on around here. Negative. Not this last week. I guess I'm the only one. You're the only one. What's that? I said, and you did good. Yeah, the the last, what was that, Friday night, I think? Clint, my brother, and I, we went over to a piece of property. Well, we had started meeting a landowner a new landowner that night um, had some coyotes on camera right behind his house. And to be honest, it's going to be a tough property. It's 17 acres. It's very narrow and it's, it's really hilly. So you guys know how it is setting up in very hilly, small areas. Coyotes can pop up on us at any time from anywhere. If you're not set up in the exact perfect location and this property we basically just waited till dark after meeting the landowner we called it and we didn't see anything we saw a couple deer um crops are starting to get pretty high are they starting to get to the point up by you guys that you're not going to be able to hunt coyotes in them for very much longer we were just i was just talking to kevin about that before we started this podcast um i said all right hey we're losing a lot of properties up by me yeah uh, we hunt a, i hunt he has a property right by me um and i drove by it actually today and i said yeah that's unhuntable already so the crops jumped up not every field is like that right yeah i've seen some fields where the corn is still probably only about eight inches um other spots you know depending on the field you go to it's getting up over a foot probably by now yeah and that's kind of what we ran into friday night we uh we called in a triple on the second set in that area after about a 30 minute drive uh rabbit distress i think it was tony tubby senior cottontail we had three of them coming down the corn and i posted the video on our youtube channel of that one and you could you could pick heat coming up with the thermal but it was really hard to tell what they were because the corn was just to that point where you were seeing tops of their bodies and and their heads you know um but we ended up killing two out of those three we went over to a oh uh, what was that second field we cut co- wow it was another cornfield and basically got out of the truck took about 15 20 steps and turned on my scanner my uh my thermal scanner looked out in front of us and there was i think seven of them in the field walking out in just a line kevin uh you know that field because that's where tony bott and segna mountain lodge outdoors was with us in december i believe and he missed one on the tree line it ran out in front of us and i shot that one on the run the same field right there but that corn 
was also getting to the point where we just it, it I probably won't be able to hunt it again until the crops have been harvested at this point. And that was only a week ago. But we killed two out of those. We got four that night, so that was a pretty good night for us. But um, you know, we really want to introduce everybody on our team. And tonight Kevin Raw is with us. Kevin, we just want to know you know, how you got started predator hunting, what you started with, if you were a day hunter or a night hunter. Um, so I guess we'll go ahead and just let you take it from here for a minute. I want to say I originally started predator hunting probably around 2001. That was when I first got into it. Um, my first experience is what got me hooked. I was just doing some reading about it in different magazines and online forums and all that. And I remember reading an article about the old timers, how they used to go out and just use lip squeaks and call in predators and do good with it. And uh, at the time I was working at a shop here in town and uh, I was working a second shift and it was getting towards dark. It was dusk, you know, and I didn't want to look like a dork standing inside lip squeaking with the other employees around. So on my break, I went outside in the parking lot and it dropped down, there's a small field there, and then it went into a bunch of woods and pines and such. I looked around, make sure no one else was looking, and practice some lip squeaks, just simple. <laughs> and I had a gray fox come busting out of the wood line, come up to within like 20 feet of me. And that was my first experience with a predator at all. And I, after that, I went out and I bought a, uh, was a Cass Creek electronic collar. It had a little hand unit that had six collars on it and a 50 foot cable that went to a speaker the size of a softball and i played around with that for a long time never had any success you know occasionally i'd get a howl here and there i think i got back door one time during the winter uh seen their tracks came up to where i walked through and then they left never seen them no uh, I, can i stop you for a second for uh, anybody that doesn't <laughs> For anybody that doesn't understand what backdoored means, what does that mean, Kevin? So that's when you have a coyote. Basically, when I set up, I like to have either a crosswind or the wind in my face, and I use the terrain behind me as a barrier. Well, sometimes that doesn't work so well, especially when you're new and don't know what the heck you're doing. So I'm facing an open field, and this is at dark, facing an open field, and there's a patch of woods behind me that was only about 50 yards wide, 75 yards wide. So I figured if anything, the coyotes were going to come from the deeper woods in front of me. Well, instead of that, they came along the edge of that woods behind me. And when I walked out, I found their tracks. They came out to right where I walked in, right where my tracks were, and then they turned around left. So basically backdooring is when the coyotes come in behind you. And more often than not, you're not going to see them. So after that, I ended up upgrading the speaker. To, it was a Cass County Bighorn speaker, which is a little bit bigger speaker, had better volume. Uh, still never had any success with that. But Cass County or Cass Creek? Cass Creek, yeah. <laughs> uh, ran that for a while, didn't have any luck with that. Uh, my next step from there was I got an MP3 player. I'm, I'm aging myself a little bit there, but had an MP3 player. Downloaded some free sounds from Barman Al's webpage, which is still out there. He still has sounds on it. And then still use that speaker off that. And that's how I killed my first coyote. That was a daytime coyote. I was sitting in a tripod stand on the corner of that same field where I was back door. It was September, um, early part of September. It was before small game had started. And uh, I think I'd been running the call for over half an hour. And I was watching some deer and turn and look the other direction. Here came this coyote bounding across this field in the grass. At the time, I had an AR-15 with a red dot sight on it. Uh, actually, one of the first rifles, semi-auto rifles I'd had. Uh, put the red dot on and pulled the trigger, hit it. He started spinning. I kept shooting. And the grass was so tall, dust was flying. It was dry, you know, all that. Uh, grass was so tall, it disappeared. So I didn't know if it was dead or not. So I waited for a while. And I'm like, well, now I'll go find this thing. So I uh, got down out of my tree stand or the tripod blind I was in, went looking for this coyote. I didn't have a flashlight. So I'm looking around for this coyote that I don't know if it's dead or alive. And grass, it's almost knee high. <laughs> and uh, that, was, that was the first time I decided, hey, I need a light. 
Um, so that between when I first started in 2001, roughly till uh, that first coyote I killed, I want to say it was probably two to three seasons before I killed my first coyote. After that, I upgraded my collar. I went to a Fox Pro. That was a firestorm then, primarily still hunting daylight. Then I had a, another guy that I started talking to that had uh, was giving me more information, teaching me more about coyote hunting. Uh, he took me out and he says, hey, let's try some nighttime hunting. And so he introduced me to some red lights he had. Back then, you know, when we went out at night, we had red lights. I think he had one on a tripod. He would scan with that. We had red lights on the guns. Don't really remember having too much success during that. We called a few in, but never really got them. Then I decided to get night vision because I figured that would be even better. So I got a uh, ATN first generation night vision scope. Got my first nighttime coyote with that. Uh, using that on a 22 mag. Back then we were restricted to rimfire shotgun only. I had it on a 22 mag. Killed a couple of that. Uh, then decided to upgrade both the gun and the scope. Uh, went to the ATN X Site 2 because I had day and night capabilities. I wanted to still use the gun for squirrel hunting and stuff. It was only rimfire I had. So the X Site 2 gave me day and night. Uh, still using the red light and then an infrared with the X Site 2, but we were using red light to scan. And uh, we had some success with that. Uh, after that, I upgraded my collar to the Fox Pro Fusion. Still did a lot of daylight calling for probably a year or two after that. And then we, you know, once we got into the red lights and started using the night vision, started doing more and more nighttime hunting. And I would say probably two thirds of my hunting now is nighttime and probably a third of it's daytime. I still like to call daytime. Now, I mean, we use, I have night vision, I have thermal and, you know, hunt day and night. Currently use Fox Pro Fusion still, and then I also have a Lucky Duck Revolt, and then of course the mouth calls. So I use a little bit of everything now, uh, several different guns, obviously. It's just, I base the gun on, you know, when I'm gonna call, where I'm gonna call, the type of terrain, daytime, nighttime, whatever. Now, how do you choose a weapon based on terrain or a caliber based on terrain? Okay, a lot of it has to do with the distance I expect to be shooting. Um, if I'm going to be, and you know, it depends too, like population, populated area versus a rural area. If I'm in a populated area, I'll use a lighter caliber, sometimes even 17 still. If it's going to be longer shots, then I'll usually take out something with a little bit more oomph behind it. If I'm in a big open area, I want something in case I have to take a longer shot, even though I still try and keep my shots 200 yards or less. Um, but I'll still take a gun that I know is going to be more than capable to take that longer shot. And obviously, real tight, thick quarters, then I'm running a shotgun still. Now, when you started using lights at night, do you remember what your first light was? Well, you know, I think it was something off eBay or something like that or something I bought online. It did have a red LED, but it was a small unit. Like I said, we just used it to scan. Um, and then eventually we were actually at the woods and water show over on the other side of the state. And we ran into uh, predator hunter outdoors and Paul Cianciolo and uh, ended up getting his light set up, the headlamp. And then the uh, NS back then, what was it? Uh, I don't, it was a 550 back then. Might've been before the 550. It was before the 550. Yeah, it was before the 550. So I don't remember what it was, if it was a 200 or what it was, but you know, that was my first good light experience the one off ebay was i mean it worked but it didn't work all that great that that's kind of how mine was too we talked in the last podcast about those primos night blasters that we used and they were decent for you know 150 200 yard identification but you had to carry a six volt battery with you and you had to not drop the red lens filter or you were going to be using a white light and in my opinion, in Michigan, white is not a good option. You pretty much want to go with red. Um, Mike, do you remember, I, I, we talked in the last podcast about you starting pretty much with the night vision. Yeah, yeah. I, I, like we said in the last podcast, I, I missed the whole red light face. Um, getting introduced with, to Kevin, you know, at, at the beginning of my hunting career i took his more of his advice on what to buy how to get into it and he took that whole 
that whole learning curve that you guys talk about, you know, it took many years to call on a predator. He took that whole curve right out for me. So I went, I, what did I buy? I bought the 4K, uh, ATN's Pro 4K um, with a NS750 is what I bought. It was my very first light. Yep. Yep. That was my very first light. Um, I think you bought right off the bat, you bought the Tony Tebby kit. Yeah, the very, very right after the bat, I bought that. Yeah. Just taking his advice on what to buy. I was actually initially going to buy thermal instantly, but actually, Kevin talked me out of it because I didn't, I never really hunted with thermal and the identification of an animal. You know, he says, Hey, why don't you, uh, you need to go with at least a light to, I, get into this, learn predator hunting, you know, hunt public land a lot before you start going on people's properties and say that you can hunt these coyotes. Um, so he talked me into the, you know, the buying lights instead of going right to the thermal game, um, oh, which yeah. I'm glad he did too. Cause there's that, that's that, there's still that learning curve, no matter if I had him in my corner to ask questions or you guys, you know, on the team. Another point with that too, and I still tell this to people too, is that, you know, especially right now, you got a lot of guys that want to get into it and they look at it and, you know, a lot of people push them to thermal right off the bat. Well, not everyone has a budget for thermal. No. And I would, I would hate to recommend to somebody, Hey, yeah, go ahead, do this, buy a thermal. They spend, you know, thousands of dollars on a thermal. They spend, you know, a bunch of money on a gun and then they get into it and they don't have any luck and they realize this is stupid. I'm getting out of it. Yep. And you've had all that money invested. And now you're getting out of it. Whereas night vision is a lot more affordable for the average person to be able to get involved in it. Lights is even more affordable, but night vision is a whole lot more affordable than thermal. And well, and one thing, one thing for sure um, is that, you know, the night vision nowadays usually has a night and day capability. Yeah. The ATN 4K Pros, they are good for night or day, and you can use them legally in Michigan for deer hunting if you do not have an infrared illuminator attached to them and you are not hunting after dark. And that's another big thing for people that want to get into night vision. You know, nobody, as far as I'm concerned, night vision with day vision, daytime capabilities, most people getting into the coyote hunting aren't just starting hunting. Most of these guys are hunting deer beforehand, and a lot of the time, that is why they get into coyote hunting, from what I've seen. That's what got me into coyote hunting, was deer hunting and seeing coyotes. And then later down the line, my baby brother Eric shot his first deer we had to let it go overnight uh we went and tracked it the next day and the coyotes had eaten every last bit of that deer besides the rack and the arrow that was the only thing we found and that is when i pretty much started my vendetta 365 24 7 with the coyotes yeah and that's on that note too that's why i, I went with the whites also because i when i when i got with kevin this gun that I built, they actually he built for me. Um, it was going to be a multi-purpose gun, and that's why I wanted something that I could deer hunt with. Everything in the, you know, I wanted a, a caliber that I could. It was a multi-purpose caliber. Yep. And that's why another reason why he wanted me to, you know, recommended not wanted. I'd say recommended to go with the 4K that it gives it multiple. I can I can deer hunt with this scope. I can deer hunt, you know, I can coyote hunt with this scope. That's one of the bigger reasons why I didn't jump right into the thermal game. Yes. And again, that's another budgetary concern as well, too, because if you, let's say you, you don't want, you don't have the money to buy two different guns to set up one for each, you can have one that's, you know, multi-purpose. And again, going back to what I used to do, that's why I switched to that on my rimfire, because I wanted to be able to use that gun for squirrel hunting, you know, and obviously back then, especially the, a traditional first generation night vision scope, no matter brand anything, it's dedicated night vision. You cannot use it during the day. You will ruin the tube on it. Yep. So when digital night vision became available and affordable, it gave you that option of using both on the same gun, which saves you from having to buy another gun to set up another optic. 
which is kind of what we do. You know, I have a couple different rifle caliber options, so but I don't have a lot of scope options. I, I have just a couple of ATN scopes, but I trade them between my boys' crossbow for, for bow season. Um, this year, I'm going to be putting on, putting uh, one of the scopes on an, a, a 350 Legend, and that's the good thing about having these digital night vision with day capabilities. Now, I can swap them between any... You know, up to what? What's the rating, Kevin, on the 4K Pro? It's like a 416. Okay, rated up to 416 Barrett. So I can put these on any deer caliber for the state of Michigan, and even if I got out of the game of predator hunting, I would still have a day capable, small game, big game scope in my hands. Yep, with with video capability. With I, video capability, and that's that's huge for me. Which is huge, my. You know, my my kids, I, I will, they, they killed their first deer those last two years, both of my daughters. And being able to, that's another big thing, being able to look back. I didn't, when I was a kid, I didn't have them capabilities. Oh. Being able to go back and watch every bit of this hunt through that scope is, you know, another thing that is phenomenal, I would say. Well, and being able to record and go back and slow-mo these videos has been essential for like my son Carter's doe last year, I got to slow motion his video through the ATN scope showing exactly where he pulled the trigger on that crossbow, where those cross crosshairs were holding. And that is an essential tool if you can get it for recovering these animals. Yeah, shot placement, everything on that animal. Well, not only that, but as a shooter, I mean, I think everyone in this that's talking right now has made a shot and they're like, there ain't no way I missed that coyote or there ain't no way I missed that deer. And then you go back and look at the video and slow it down. You look at it on a bigger screen, like on your TV and you're like, yeah, I pulled that shot. I just suck. Yeah. We pulled that (laughs) one. How many times have we done that? The last time I was up there with you, Kevin, I did that. That coyote should have been dead to rights. Right. (laughs) Play back the video and you're like, just gotta hang your head and accept it. Mm -hmm. on On that token also, that, that coyote that I actually sent a video to you, we gave up on, we shot it up north with me, you, and Jeremy. Yep. These guys are saying, no way, absolutely, you missed that coyote, you missed that coyote. I <laughs> sent that video to you, Josh, and you were like, you, the next day, and you are like, you need to go look for that coyote. That coyote is dead. You hit that thing in the heart. And I'm like, no, we looked for it. <laughs> sure enough, Kevin actually went out there that very next day because I was at work, and he found that coyote, what? 50 yards from where we stopped yeah. looking yeah you know because jeremy and i were watching it through thermals and that coyote didn't look like it was hit the way it moved looking even at his video when we looked at us like yeah the, the crosshairs were on it it was where he was supposed to be but that coyote didn't drop didn't spin it just turned around and ran we're like man i don't think you hit that coyote and in hindsight you know you feel bad about it because we made the wrong call and saying we didn't think that coyote was hit but mm-hmm. you know at that time, I didn't know Mike as well as I did, but he was very confident in his shot. And I said, well, I'm going to go out and look for it anyhow. And I walked out in the field and I said, okay, we've seen it run this way. So I started walking out there and I think I found it by the flies, to be honest. It actually ran out and then went underneath the pine tree and was laying there deader in a door now, like you said, like 50 yards out. Yeah, that that's one thing I love about that video. And I get, I get videos fairly often sent to my messenger box of people saying what do you think i did here and that one i mean we've seen it before coyotes shot through the heart can run like crazy sure just like deer you know there's a lot of guys that make good shots on deer and you'll have a blood trail that a blind man could follow and that deer will still run a mile and coyotes are no different in some cases i think i've seen coyotes run further than what i think deer would and oh still, absolutely i i really believe if you shoot a deer through the heart that deer is not going to go more than 50 60 yards but i have watched coyotes run shoot the one in the up mike yeah. how much damage did i do to that one the second night and that thing ran 150 yards if not more even yeah, yeah. Grand, you had a good blood trail to follow with those 70 grain uh that i'm shooting out of that 243 but that they are tough 
animals, whether people want to believe that or not. Yeah, that, that night was funny though. You, you pulled that trigger, he's dead. <laughs> you watched that thing run across that field. He, he didn't have a chance. I knew he was dead by the, just the reaction of it. But Kevin, of you don't have just one one option for a rifle anymore. But of all your options. What is your chosen option for I, if, if you could take one gun, if you only had one gun, what would it be? Well, I mean, my favorite gun for pretty much everything at this point is my AR-15 and 6.5 Grendel. I know guys take bigger game with it. I guess I wouldn't hesitate to do it because of the right shot placements could do the job. I mean, there's guys even in Michigan and out west that have taken game as big as elk with it. I've watched Randy Bear drop a bear, or Randy Booty drop a bear in his tracks with it. And to be honest with you, I'm, I'm very comfortable with that gun and very happy with how it performs on everything I've shot with it. I've shot antelope at 250 yards. I've shot white-tailed deer. I've shot hogs. I've shot coyotes, fox, bobcat, raccoons, skunks. I mean, pretty much anything that I could shoot, I've shot with it. And it's always performed really well for me. Now, I want to bring up the fact that I think you are the only one of all of us that has been a successful bobcat hunter, have you not? I believe uh, so. Yeah, I think so. And you shot that one with a 6.5 Grendel, and I remember the first one you shot. Yeah. And they seem like tough animals, too. Yeah. The first bobcat I shot was actually with my 223. I was using at that time, it was a 60 grain nozzle ballistic tip. My shot was probably about 75 yards. I shot, and I got the video of it, and I posted it before, but the cat was sitting down facing me through a bunch of brush. I threaded a needle on it. At the shot, the cat just took off running, and it ran up a hill that I was sitting on into a bunch of really thick brush, and I heard it yowl like twice. But before it got dark, I went over there and looked all over, and I could not find that cat. So I showed the video to a couple other people, I told people that knew more about it than I did what happened. Everyone was like, well, if that cat yowled, you hit that cat. So I actually, I was so worked up about it. I took part of the day off from work the next day. I went out there and met up with the guy that owns a property. We walked out there and he's like, oh, where were you sitting? I said, I was sitting right here. He says, where was the cat? It was down there. Where did it go? I said, it ran up this way. He walked about 10 feet and he says, there's your cat. And it went up into some deadfalls and died hanging over a down tree so i was and when we skinned that cat jeremy and i skinned it the bullet had entered in the front chest right between the uh basically the brisket and the shoulder and exited out the rear ham and that bullet never opened up which explained why that cat reacted the way it did and why it ran as far as it did so that's when i actually quit using the nozzle or ballistic tip back then fast forward i think it was no two, uh, can I interrupt you for yeah. a second? I yeah. think people need to know what your side hobby is because you know your bullets. Yeah, well, my side hobby, I have a regular full-time job, obviously, but my side job slash hobby is I'm a uh, firearms dealer and a gunsmith. I've been doing this for probably close to 20 years and uh, do it just as a side business out of my house. And like you said, it's more of a hobby than business because I really don't make a whole lot of money at it. I'm also a reloader. I've been reloading for probably close to 30 years. Take the time to you know do good load development. And I specifically choose bullets for what I'm gonna do. And then I also uh, have done a lot of ballistic testing with custom bullets and everything. So I try and if, if someone comes to me and says, hey, this is what I want to do, what do you recommend? When I make a recommendation, it's based off field use. It's not based off what someone reads in the catalog. It's not based off what a manufacturer says. It's based off, you know, I have a lot of customers and I'll say, hey, try this ammo. If it works, send me pictures. If you skin the animal, send me pictures of skinning it. So we're getting basically, you know, post postmortem results that I use to give people an educated information on as to what they should use and obviously i've used that myself as well in my own personal ammunition so like as an example with uh my 260 remington i built that with the intention of it being a deer slash predator gun and for potentially animals bigger than deers and i've taken bear with it i've taken coyotes with it and i've taken white-tailed deer with it and 
I've used three different loads for that gun. I've used a 95 grain VMAX. I've used 130 grain Sierra Game Changer. Actually, those are the two primary loads I've used for it. Game Changer, I've used on bear. My bear went probably no more than 35, 40 yards. Had really good performance, nice exit on it. Coyote, I've used 95 grain VMAX. And actually, Mike was with me, the very first coyote I ever shot with that gun, and it just anchored that coyote. Dropped him. And then um, I actually shot my deer last year with a 95 grain VMAX. I was leery of using that bullet, but talking to Randy Booty, who knows way more than I do, he said at the velocities of that gun, that bullet should work really well for deer. And I tried it and it worked really well on that deer. So, you know, I, I, I try and make sure that I tailor my loads and any recommendations I give to other people based off actual field use. So fast forward to my next Bobcat. That one was taken with a 6.5 Grendel two years ago. And during that year, I was using new bullet from Nosler, the 90 grain Barmageddon. Had really good velocity. Uh, terminal performance on coyotes was probably 50-50 in terms of being fur friendly, whether it blew a big hole in them or it didn't leave a hole at all. It was uh, really rough on Fox though. Which is one thing that, you know, during the, the winter months, we try to preserve as many good furs as we possibly can. Oh, yeah. Yeah, either to sell them or to hang them on your own wall. Either way, you want to try and save them and use them if you can. Yeah, preserve the memories or, you know, at least put good use to them. Right. What bullet would be your choice for the most fur-friendly out of your 6.5 Grendel? Right now, my two bullets that I would recommend for predator hunting out of the Grendel are going to be either the 100 grain Nosler ballistic tent or a 95 grain VMAX. The 95 grain VMAX actually has worked better on fox in terms of being fur friendly. I've killed several fox with it and it's always actually done pretty darn good. Uh, the 100 grain Nosler ballistic tip though still tears fox up bad, but it's really good on coyotes. See, and now I can say a 70 grain Varmageddon out of a 243 is not friendly to fox at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to find something that actually is friendly with fox. I mean, there's such a, a lot of people don't realize it, but they're such a small, fragile, thin animal. Yeah. It's hard to find a good center fire round that will be effective on fox. I mean, I took one early uh, this year with my 17, even 17 WSM, and even that tore that fox up good not bad enough i couldn't save the hide i did but it still tore it up pretty good um the lighter calibers um going fast with a real frangible bullet or a good solid bullet that won't expand are your two best options for fox in my opinion and what see because i also have a 17 wsm uh savage b mag my preferred round of choice for both coyotes and fox is going to probably be the 25 grain bullet is would you agree to that i agree with that only because it's the fact that's the one that shoots best out of my gun yep um i've experimented with the 20 grainers and they just never shot as good but the 25 grains terminal performance has been good enough that i'll stick with it and it shoots more accurately out of my rifle yeah and see we've with my savage um, I know I've sent I've sent you uh, grouping shots. My 25 grains grouped the best to begin with, like during that barrel break-in period. And the 20 grains have, have tightened up quite a bit. But my son, Carter, he shot one with that 17 with a 20 grain at about, right about 150 yards, I don't know, January or February this year. And you guys have seen that video. That coyote absolutely dumped. Mm -hmm. but with a smaller caliber i just tend I, and i don't for anybody listening i don't know ballistics i don't know any of that stuff i just for a 17 wsm my choice is the heavier bullet because i feel like it's going to hit just a little bit harder and that was one of the problems back when we could only use a rim fire or only use a shotgun at night how many coyotes did we have to track with a 17 uh, HMR or a 22? 
And I, I've always just chosen that heavier bullet with whatever caliber I, I've chosen to hunt with just because of that knockdown power with that heavier bullet. Yeah, and, you know, back in the early days, like I said, when I was using lights or using the first-gen night vision, I was using a 22 mag. I had a Marlin bolt action 22 mag. I killed a couple coyotes with that, but the ones that I killed with it required multiple shots. And even on that, I was using, uh, if I remember correctly, I was using a 40-grain Hornady VMAX load. So it's a heavier load for that 22 mag, but still all those coyotes required multiple shots. And that's one of the reasons why I went to the 17 was to get the extra velocity. And then I still ran the 25 grain versus the 20 grain in that, because same thing, I like a little bit heavier bullet with something like that. Now, okay, now, so my question is, you had an option between a 40 grain bullet or a 17 with a 25 or 20 grain bullet, but was shooting faster. Would you, would you choose a weapon based or a caliber based more on velocity or bullet weight availability? I think it goes to also uh, bullet design is a big thing in there because, for example, a high velocity bullet that is real strongly constructed is going to leave a pinhole size that's not going to expand. You're not going to get the good terminal performance that you really want. Whereas a real fast bullet that's lightly constructed you may get the explosive uh, performance that you want but you might not get penetration now you take that the other direction you go with a heavy bullet that's slow that's strongly built you're going to get a bigger hole through because obviously you're starting with a bigger projectile but again you won't get that expansion whereas you go with a heavier bullet that is lighter constructed you will more likely to get a good mushroom out of the bullet. So, I mean, the bullet construction comes into that as well and the type of game that you're going to shoot with it. Um, I, I wouldn't choose a lightweight, fast, light constructed bullet for big game. But at the same time, if I wanted to preserve fur on an animal and all I had was a bigger caliber gun, I would more than likely try and find a heavier bullet that is very strongly constructed so you don't get that explosive result and blow big holes in them. Mike, you stated in the last podcast that you also choose a 6.5 Grendel. Correct. What bullet of all your uh, bullet options would you choose? So I, when I originally built the gun, uh, I, I ran the Hornady Blacks 123 grain. I mean, I've killed plenty of coyotes with them. Um, and deer. And deer. And then actually, with low development with Kevin, went with a 95 grain VMAX that he loads, actually. Actually, I came over and actually loaded my first time. Or I loaded my own ammunition with them. They perform really well. Now, I don't know if I will actually go with them for deer hunting this year. I think I will still go back to the 123 grain Hornady Blacks, just for the fact that I've, I've, I've watched them perform on, I've shot two deer with them and my, both my daughters have shot one deer each with that load and it's performed phenomenal. I mean, I've, I, I haven't had a deer run more than 60 yards and actually two out of them, four deer have actually dropped in their tracks. I didn't have to track them one bit. So I, I, and that's a heavier bullet and it's not traveling quite as fast as a 95 at all, but it, it performed really well on bigger game besides coyote. And that's one thing that a lot of people talk about, especially with the 6.5 Grendel, the 123 grain black or the predecessor, which was a 123 grain Amax, a lot of people poo-poo it, and Hornady says right out in their load data that it is not designed as a hunting bullet. Yet, Mike's success with it has been good. Other people I know, their success has been good with it. I've shot deer with 123 grain AMAX, and it performed really well. So even though it was technically a matched bullet, its terminal performance was still really good on deer size game. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I cannot complain. And on hogs too. That's what you use for I hogs. I used it on. We went to Louisiana. Yep. 
Um, you and Jeremy both were using. We are both handle. using the 123 grain uh, Hornady Blacks, and it performed well on hogs in Louisiana also. And we probably got a couple hogs that were 200 pounds plus. Oh, easy. A couple big boars in there. But on deer, it performed really well. But again, I won't, I don't think I would use the 95 grain just because I've, I love the performance of the 123 grain out of that Grendel on them. <laughs> As much talk as we do about Jeremy, we're going to have to get him on here pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, eventually. Jeremy is uh, RT Taxidermy. He is with Overdrive Outdoors, and he is another great predator hunter. He goes out with Kevin a lot. They live in the same general vicinity. He's Mike's brother-in-law. But, uh, yeah, we're definitely going to have to get him on the podcast here. So, Kevin... Do you remember, I mean, was there anything that just made you a predator hunter? Is there a reason that you decided you wanted to try to be a predator hunter? To be honest with you, it was a challenge. You know, uh, back to what I was talking about earlier when I first got started reading magazine articles, forums, and all that. Predator hunting was a challenge. Um, Everyone talked about how hard they are to hunt, and at that point, I mean, to be completely honest, deer hunting was getting boring for me. Um, I wanted something that was more of a challenge. I wanted to see, you know, after that gray fox came running in, I'm like, man, this is this is cool having a predatory animal coming to you. Um, it was honestly, too, my first experience calling an animal. Um, you know, I never really tried calling for deer. I'd never turkey hunted at that point. So calling was like, man, this is kind of cool. You know, you make the right sounds and do everything right. And they come to you. I mean, that's pretty cool. Um, Then also prior to when I first got my first coyote, I was up at our deer camp one one time. And uh, I got up there late in the evening for the evening hunt. I was a little bit late and I didn't want to drive back to our cabin and interrupt everybody else's hunt. So I stopped. On the two track on the way in, I figured, well, I'll just sit and hunt the uh, swamp edge, you know, see if a deer come in. Well, right at dark, a group of coyotes started running the pines between me and the property where we deer hunt. And that was actually the first time I'd ever really seriously heard coyotes um, here in Michigan. And it just kind of like, wow, that's cool. It's kind of scary, you know. I mean, like a lot of people when they hear coyotes, it actually scares them. So at that time, I was a little concerned. I mean, as using a uh, uh, Enfield 308 bolt-action rifle at the time, and I'm sitting here thinking, man, do I have enough ammo if these things come my way? Um, But that right there, combined with the whole challenge of, you know, calling in a predator is what really did it for me. And now, I mean, even now, you know, fast forward to almost 20 years, I still get excited every time I get called in a predator. It doesn't matter if it's a coyote, a fox, a bobcat, um, I still get excited about it. And I, knowing that I set up right, I did my calling right, I was camouflaged or set right, you know, knowing that I did everything right enough to get that predator to come in, um, to me, every time is an accomplishment and it's a feed in of itself. Yeah, and that that definitely is a, a good feeling knowing that you've done everything right because, like I've explained before, I did everything wrong for probably four years. Right. And Kevin, you and I met up. We originally had, I believe, first talked on the Scrap Horn Predator Boards. Yeah. That was an online forum. And, man, I can't even remember. But when I first started this, I believe there was three to 400 people on that board talking about (laughs) Michigan coyote hunting. There, There wasn't a lot of people back then. No. But then, you know, social media, Facebook, everything came around. And it was a long time between scrap horn boards and Facebook that you and I connected through that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, like I said, it was through that board. And then I think also, you know, Predator Masters was out there and that's still around. And then also the Michigan Sportsman's Forum. Um, I know we communicated a couple times through both of those. And I think one of the things that really got us talking more was actually when they started hosting some of their tournaments that they had. So back then, uh, once you got a coyote, you had to take a picture of you with a coyote and then a playing card, if I remember right. And I remember kind of challenging you. We went back and forth and 
I think you ended up coming out on top, but I was right on your coattails. <laughs> uh, you know, we did that, and then we, we just to do the three side or you know whatever. I was in zone yeah. three. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot about that. Different zones. And then, uh, you know, after that, then I remember we just decided to get together and hunt one time. And if I remember right, the first time we hunted together was me, you, and your brother. And uh, I mean, that started it all in terms of us getting together and hunting. And then, you know, everything else after that continued for a while. And, you know, eventually it led to the start of Overdrive Outdoors. Yeah. Well, to be honest, before we even hunted, the first time I had ever come up to meet you, shake your hand face to face, was because I was looking for a specific shotgun. Yes. And you were the only guy that could get it for yep. me. Legacy Sports International Turkey slash Coyote Tactical Shotgun. That is right. That was my baby, but things have uh, things have happened. I no longer own that firearm, but you were the only guy that could get it for me. So people keep that in mind if they're that <laughs> specific you might need that not very many other people might carry kevin at tools of the trade sales and service might very well be able to get it for you not right now probably probably not i, mean, <laughs> I was gonna ask you earlier how you're liking the reloading prices right now well since i haven't had to buy any of my own components because i had enough stockpiled it's not affecting me but um you know the prices of components Powder and bullets aren't terrible, but primers have just went nuts, both in availability and pricing. Um, a normal brick of primers, which is a thousand primers, I believe I was selling them the last time I could get them for about 35 bucks a thousand. I've seen them going for over $400 for a brick on gun broker. Yeah, that's, it's ridiculous that's right insane. now. Yep. That's why I'm trying to, to shoot very little. No mag dumps for me. <laughs> <laughs> right. I've been watching some videos lately of people mag dumping on coyotes running across fields. And it's like uh, two, four, six, eight, ten. You're down ten bucks already, and you never even right. killed a coyote. <laughs> well, you know that's the thing too is, especially with all the different groups we're on, forums that we're on, everything else. I mean, you've probably seen it too. How many people do you see out there? Like, man, I'm running out of ammo. Can someone hook me up? You know, yep. I'll take a box of anything you can get, and it's just the availability isn't there. So. I, I think pe people in general are trying to be a little bit more careful about their shoot shots and how much they shoot. But there's people out there right now that say, man, if I can't get any more ammo, I'm not going to be able to do much hunting. Yeah. It's just the state of the industry, so to speak, right now, unfortunately. Now, Kevin, you also run a suppressed rifle. What is your suppressor of choice and why do you want to shoot suppressed? I actually have two different suppressors. I have a Yankee Hill Machine Phantom, which is the first suppressor I ever bought. It's a dedicated direct thread uh, 223 suppressor. My second suppressor is an OSS Helix Magnum. Uh, that one I actually use on right now two different guns because it has a QD adapter on it. The Yankee Hill Phantom on the 223 right now, dedicated to the 223, is better on sound suppression. That's because it is true to bore size. It's made for a 223. Well, I actually use it on my 204 now as well. So um, it's closer to bore size though. So it's effective, more effective in terms of sound suppression. The OSS um, is actually the OSS Magnum, which is rated for up to a 338 Lapua. And I'm shooting it on a 6.5 Grendel, my 260 Remington. So the sound suppression isn't as good, but the OSS, design allows the gases to be vented through the front of the suppressor which means on a normal baffle design suppressor the gases will actually often be more gas flowed back into the action of the gun on an ar-15 this can be important because you end up with a dirtier action you tank the rounds out that you didn't shoot they're dirty they're going to corrode if you don't clean them up the oss doesn't do that i mean i can shoot you know a full mag through that oss and take the magazine out and the brass is still pretty much clean so right now my plan is eventually to get another oss suppressor that's closer to bore size so the sound suppression will match better and i'll have better uh, performance that way why do i like to shoot suppressed because for one it's easier on my ears um 
as a lot of predators, hunters around here do, you don't always hunt alone, you hunt with a partner. And if you're shooting to your left at a coyote and your, name, your, your, your partner's on the right and he shoots at the same coyote on the left, sometimes that gets really loud if you're not suppressed. Um, you hear it in videos. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, Stop shooting. So it's, it's better for my ears. It's better for my partner's ears. And I honestly think that the animals react different to it. With a good suppressor, the sound that they hear is non-directional because pretty much the only sound they hear is a supersonic crack of the bullet, which is non-directional. As opposed to a non-suppressed rifle, there's a report at the rifle and they can hear that direction. I've had animals, uh, coyotes specifically, that I've shot at and missed that actually turned and ran straight towards me or ran in a circle. It was like they didn't know where it was coming from, so they didn't know where to go. I think the suppressor helps with that in terms of them not being able to locate the origin of that shot and not always reacting the same or knowing how to react because of it. Well, a lot of people know me. That's something I definitely need. <laughs> the animals to come closer after I miss. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm on the other hand of that. Uh, actually, I just purchased my a form one. But on my token, though, I mean, how many times have we been out there, Kevin? Though that I've shot with you, and in my personal experience, and I, I agree with Kevin 100% on the suppressor. But I've I've shot a coyote at 100 yards and turned up, and here comes another one. Two seconds later, charging in straight at me, still. And I, I think it's more that the reason I'm going with suppressed is for my partners and my kids hearing more than animals' reactions, I would say. Well, and one big thing for, you know, I'm waiting on mine. I got a Form 4. I've got a uh, Dead Air Sandman S coming for my 243. One of my big reasons for wanting to get one, number one, so I can hunt with Kevin without getting yelled at. He yells a lot, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. Number two is because we deal with, I deal with law enforcement quite often due to gunshots at night. Yep. Yes. And not that I'm doing anything illegal, but if my gun is just a little bit quieter, it doesn't have that crack like an unsuppressed rifle. It'll hopefully clear some of that up. Yes, I've had that too. As a matter of fact, uh, I had a landowner last year that got a hold of me, wanted me to come out and shoot coyotes at his place. And this is a daytime set. He was home. You know, I talked to him. I went back out back behind his house. And I was probably within 100 yards of his house or less and called in a coyote and killed it. And, you know, I went and recovered it. And I was dragging it back. And he comes out and he says, what are you dragging? I said, well, I got a coyote. He said, I never even heard you shoot. I said, well, that's because of the suppressor. That helps a lot. How far from his house or whatever were you? Like I said, probably about 100 yards, give or take, back in the woods behind his place. And, uh, you know, that's, you know, not only the landowner, but surrounding people that might not know you're out there. Yep. You know, the more shots they hear, I mean, you see on these some of these, like, scanner pages on Facebook, people getting on there oh my gosh did you hear those booms what was that you know, and, you know the suppressor can help with that it makes it so it's not as loud not going to be cause as much alarm per se as it would be unsuppressed um yeah. over in europe they actually consider it good manners to have a suppressor they like people to have them because it's quieter yep. um so i mean that and then you add to that here in conservation um my dad you know he'd he was a contractor for years and years. He was a hunter all the time. And I'd look at him and his hearing is bad enough. He has to have hearing aids. I don't want to be that if I can help it. And if I can suppress my gunshots to conserve my hearing or my partner's hearing, then, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's a health and a long-term benefit as well. See, now I'm, I'm married, so I kind of get the fact of going deaf by the time I'm 80 also. <laughs> <laughs> Mike's Mike's got his thumbs up. He gets it. <laughs> well, what you, what you get then is called selective hearing. <laughs> I've had that since the day I was born. Just ask my mom. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think we pretty much covered everything. We introduced you, Kevin. Um, you know, Kevin and I, we started Overdrive 2014. We got together and 
basically we said, you know, I'm tired of watching everybody fight about everything on Facebook. And that was, I hate to keep bringing up Facebook because honestly, <laughs> I, I don't really care for Facebook anymore. But Facebook at the time was where everybody was seeing, you know, what everybody was doing. And that's how we got to know each other. It wasn't even through the forums at the time. We got to know each other as, you know, local com competition through the through the forums. But in Facebook, we became friends. And then we became partners in Overdrive Outdoors. And we brought on people such as Mike, such as my brother Joe, Jeremy, Steve. We've got a lot of guys to introduce to this to 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 all of the listeners here but overdrive was started you and i said we're tired of watching everybody fight about everything watching everybody talk down to everybody else because of what they choose to hunt and how they choose to hunt them and we wanted to start a basically a, an area that everybody could come share their experience share their hunt share their pictures without getting judged or hated on because we don't allow it. We were trying to start a safe space before a safe space were cool. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. Now that we say it, I kind of want to go back and revert that. <laughs> I don't like a safe space anymore. <laughs> right, but that's what it was. You know, you'd have a kid go out and he shot, you know, to him it was a trophy animal, but was only a spike or a four point or a dull. And people would, you know, give them a bunch of grief. Oh, you should have let it go. You shouldn't shoot that, blah, blah, blah. Even me personally, the first coyote I shot that I talked about earlier, I posted that on uh, Michigan Sportsman's or Predator Masters. I had guys giving me grief about that. Oh, you should have waited till it was prime fur. It would have been worth a whole lot more, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, there were some guys that got on there and said, hey, dude, it was his first coyote. He never shot a coyote before. You need to be happy for him. And that's what we wanted for other people was, as long as you're enjoying your hunting trip, your fishing trip, whatever, you're doing everything legal, you should celebrate every successful harvest, yes. uh, whether it be, you know, a just barely legal smallmouth bass and you've never caught one before, whether it's shooting a doe so you can put meat on the table, you should be able to celebrate that without fear of someone talking down to you, giving you a rap to grief, whatever. And it doesn't matter if you're using a traditional bow, a crossbow, a compound bow, a pellet gun, a rimfire, a shotgun, it doesn't matter what you use. I don't I don't care what equipment you use. Get out there, enjoy the outdoors, and when you're successful, you should be able to celebrate that. Mm -hmm. And even if you're not successful, if you're out there enjoying it, if you take a picture of a sunset, if you happen to see something out in the woods you've never seen before, that's what it's about. It's not always just about the harvest. It's not always just about getting the biggest and best you can get. It's about enjoying the outdoors and basically just not having someone give you a bunch of grief for it. I, I got nothing else to add to that. I that, that is straight up truth. That's why Overdrive Outdoors was created. And seven years later, <laughs> here we are. Did you ever see us making it seven years, Kevin? You know, in this day and age, there's a lot of pages that start up and don't last. I felt that even if we didn't gain the popularity, what we were there for would persevere over the years. Whether we got big or not, I mean, I, I mean, to be honest with you, I, I would have never expected to have, uh, you know, the following we have on Overdrive or the number of views we've had on some of our videos on YouTube. I, I would have never really envisioned that per se, but I always felt that the core of what we stood for, which was get out there, enjoy the outdoors, be proud of the success you have, and take pride in what you're out there doing, that would always persevere no matter how much the popularity was there. And, you know, the popularity is followed along with it, which is, you know, we kind of thought it would, but not necessarily to the extent that it has. Well, and one big thing for me right now, especially, is as much as our rights are slowly being picked away at, you still have the right to go out into those woods, breathe that fresh air, see the countryside, the prairie ground, whatever you're hunting, and just enjoy it. And nobody's telling you that you can't right now. Right. 
And that to me is huge. Go enjoy your hunt. Go live your life. You only got one of them and you better dang well live it up. And to add to that, and I don't want to get into politics, but the more people that we get involved in it that have a positive experience, the more likely we're going to be to have the heritage of outdoorsmanship continue. Um, it's constantly under attack, whether it be gun rights or you know local zoning ordinances not wanting people to shoot or you know good hunting land gets bought up, whatever. But the more people we can get involved out there having a positive experience, the more likely they're going to be to say, "Hey, this is something we enjoy." You know, we're doing it legally. We're we're um, shepherds of the land, so to speak. You know, uh, most of your good hunters, most of your hunters in general, want to be able to continue hunting in the years to come. They don't. It's not like a lot of the anti hunters say, "Oh, you want to kill every single animal?" No, we don't, because if we did that, then we wouldn't have anything done. Right. You know, we want this to continue, and the more people that enjoy it and are successful at it and have fun with it they're more likely to pass that down and you know for lack of a better way to put it you're gonna have more people on our side that will help fight to preserve these rights and you know continue the heritage so to speak well and there's been a lot of times too where i've seen like you talked about earlier you know a kid gets on and posts about his first deer that wasn't to everybody else's trophy standards that doesn't matter but you you telling that kid he made the wrong decision or he should have waited might just be telling that kid not to hunt anymore. Well, sure, they'll give up. If there's always arguments, there's always going to be people dropping out. Yep. Yeah. My, my daughter's very first buck she shot this year. At 18 years old, she shot her very first buck. It was only a three-point. But listening to her breathe... And, and, and the excitement on her face when she finally seen a buck come in and she asked me, can I shoot that buck? And I said, sis, listen to your excitement, drop that deer. You, <laughs> you have a tag, you're 100% legal, and you'll never, ever, ever forget that very first buck you shoot. And I, I, it was only a three point, you know, but the excitement on her face, it, it was priceless. Well, I mean, sure. that, that was a trophy. And two, I mean, tell a little bit about the story of Micaiah. Yeah, uh, Micaiah's, the, the coyote. She shot her very first coyote this this winter. Actually, Kevin was with us. And uh, we have this video on our YouTube channel. Yep. The excitement on her face, you know, I, and it wasn't the greatest of, you know, coyotes or whatever, but the excitement that she proclaimed, and, I, and I, that's another thing, too. I love having my kids involved in this following my passion also so yeah i i, I 100 percent believe that shaming somebody or some person for their trophy in their mind is not not something that we will ever do and i'm glad to be a part of this team that won't allow it to be honest that that is what we are here for and you know i i, I am with kevin that i never expected that we would be where we are and we appreciate everybody that has followed along for so long and contributed shared pictures with us um and just celebrated the outdoor lifestyle in general with all of us but you guys got anything else to say to finish this up we've been going for almost an hour here and you know i i i think we've pretty much covered everything we've introduced you kevin and mike everybody kind of knows you from the last podcast if you don't Go back and listen to that one. It's going to be episode one of the new Overdrive Outdoors podcast. Yeah. No, I just hope uh, everyone enjoys it. And uh, if anyone has any topics they'd like to have us discuss or even someone else that'd like to join us, I mean, just let us know. We're all about getting other people involved and hearing their story or talk about, you know, what they have going on. I agree. All right, guys. Well, I thank you very much for your time tonight. and. I know neither of you guys are going out hunting. It is 11.01 here, and I got to wake up at 5.30 to go to work. So we will talk to you guys all later. We thank you for listening. Uh, please like, subscribe to our, our YouTube page and this podcast. We appreciate everybody for listening, and we'll see you guys another time. Have a good night.
Want to lengthen your time in the field and shorten your scouting time? Not only does the HuntWise app show you property boundaries, landowners' names, and in some cases even their phone number, but using the app will show you the wind direction on the map of the place you want to hunt. And the HuntCast feature shows peak movement times for various species, including predators. Get the HuntWise app at www.huntwise.com, the Google Play Store, or the Apple App Store. For only $59.99 a year for Pro or $119.99 a year for Elite. Use promo code OVERDRIVE20 for 20% off an annual membership.